Chapter Twelve of the Story of Eclipses. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Story of Eclipses by George Chambers. Chapter Twelve. Eclipses of the Sun mentioned in history, medieval and modern. One of the most celebrated eclipses of medieval times was that of August the second, eleven thirty-three, visible as a total eclipse in Scotland. It was considered a presage of misfortune to Henry I, and was thus referred to by William of Malmesbury. The elements manifested in their sorrow at this great man's last departure from England. For the sun on that day at the sixth hour shrouded his glorious face, as the poets say, in hideous darkness agitating the hearts of men by an eclipse. And on the sixth day of the week, early in the morning, there was so great an earthquake that the ground appeared absolutely to sink down and horrid noise being at first heard beneath the surface. The eclipse is also alluded to in the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, though the year is wrongly given as 1135 instead of 1133 as it certainly was. The Chronicle says, In this year King Henry went over sea at Lammas, and the second day as he lay and slept on the ship the day darkened over all lands, and the sun became as it were a three-night old moon, and the stars about it at midday. Men were greatly wonder-stricken and affrighted, and said that a great thing should come hereafter. So it did, for the same year the king died on the following day after St. Andrew's Mass Day, December 2nd, in Normandy. The king did die in 1135, but there was no eclipse of the August new moon, and without doubt the writer has muddled up the year of the eclipse and of the king's departure from England, to which he never returned, and the year of his death. Calvisius states that this eclipse was observed in Flanders and that the stars appeared. Respecting the above-mentioned discrepancy, Mrs. Todd aptly remarks, So Henry must have died in 1133, which he did not, or else there must have been an eclipse in 1135, which there was not. But this is not the only labyrinth into which chronology and old eclipses, imagination and computation lead the unwary searcher. Professor Freeman's explanation fairly clears up the difficulty. The fact that he never came back to England, together with the circumstances of his voyage, seems to have made a deep impression on men's minds. In popular belief, the signs and wonders which marked his last voyage were transferred to the Lammas tide before his death two years later. The central line of this eclipse traversed Scotland from Ross to Forfar, and the eclipse was, of course, large in every part of the country. The totality lasted four minutes and twenty seconds in Forfarshire. Hind has furnished some further information respecting this eclipse. It appears that during the existence of the Kingdom of Jerusalem created by the Crusaders, an eclipse occurred which would appear to have been total at Jerusalem or in its immediate neighborhood. No date is given, and a date can only be guessed, and Hind guessed that the eclipse of 1133 was the one referred to. He found that after leaving Scotland and crossing Europe, the central line of the 1133 eclipse entered Palestine near Jaffa, and passed over Jerusalem where the sun was hidden for four and a quarter minutes at about three hours p.m. From Nablus on the north to Ascalon on the south, the country was in darkness for nearly the same period of time. The alternative eclipses to this one would be those of September the 4th, 1187, magnitude at Jerusalem nine-tenths of the sun's diameter, or June 23rd, 1191, magnitude at the same place about seven-tenths, but these do not seem to harmonize so well with the accounts handed down to us as does the eclipse of 1133. In 1140, on March 20th, there happened to be a total eclipse of the sun visible in England, which is thus referred to by William of Malmesbury. During this year in Lent, on the 13th of the Calends of April, at the ninth hour of the fourth day of the week, there was an eclipse throughout England as I have heard. With us, indeed, and with all our neighbors, the obscuration of the sun also was so remarkable that persons sitting at table, as it then happened almost everywhere, for it was lent, at first feared that chaos was come again. Afterwards, learning the cause, they went out and beheld the stars around the sun. It was thought and said by many, not untruly, that the king, Stephen, would not continue a year in the government. The same eclipse is also thus mentioned in the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle. Afterwards in Lent the sun and the day darkened about the noontide of the day when men were eating, 
and they lighted candles to eat by, and that was the thirteenth of the Calends of April, March twentieth. Men were greatly wonder-stricken. The greatest obscuration at London took place at two hours thirty-six minutes p.m., but it is not quite clear whether the line of totality did actually pass over London. It was long supposed that this eclipse was total at London an idea which seems to have arisen from Halley having told the Royal Society anent the total eclipse of May 3, 1715, that he could not find that any total eclipse had been visible at London since March 20, 1140. In consequence of this statement of Halley's, Hind carefully investigated the circumstances of this eclipse and found that it had not been total at London. The central line entered our island at Aberystwyth, and passing near Shrewsbury, Stafford, Derby, Nottingham, and Lincoln, reached the German Ocean ten miles south of Saltfleet. The southern limit of the zone of totality passed through the South Midland counties, and the nearest point of approach to London was a point on the borders of Northamptonshire and Bedfordshire. For a position on the central line near Stafford, Hind found that the totality began at two hours thirty-six minutes p.m. local mean time, the duration being three minutes twenty-six seconds, and the sun's altitude being more than thirty degrees. The stars seen were probably the planets Mercury and Venus, then within a degree of each other, and ten degrees west of the sun, and perhaps the stars forming the well-known square of Pegasus. Mars and Saturn were also at the time within a degree of each other, but very near the western horizon. It is therefore necessary to look further back than 1140 to find a total solar eclipse visible in London. A solar eclipse seems to have been alluded to by certain historians as having happened in A.D. 1153. We have the obscure statement that something singular happened to the sun the day after the conversion of St. Paul, a somewhat large eclipse having been visible at Augsburg in Germany on January 26th. This may have been the something referred to. It would seem that about eleven twelfths of the sun's diameter was covered. On May 14, A.D. 1230, there happened a great eclipse of the sun, thus described by Roger of Wendover. On the 14th of May, which was the Tuesday in Rogation Week, an unusual eclipse of the sun took place very early in the morning, immediately after sunrise, and it became so dark that the laborers who had commenced their morning's work were obliged to leave it, and returned again to their beds to sleep but in about an hour's time to the astonishment of many the sun regained its usual brightness. This eclipse, as regards its total phase, is said by Johnson to have begun in the horizon a little to the north of London in the early morning. On June the 3rd, A.D. 1239, and October the 6th, 1241, there occurred total eclipses of the sun, which have been very carefully discussed by Professor Saloria of Milan, with the view of using them in investigations into the moon's mean motion. The second of these eclipses is mentioned by Tycho Brahe. He states that a few stars appeared about noonday, and the sun was hidden from sight in a clear sky. The eclipse was total in Eastern Europe. Dr. Lingard, the well-known Roman Catholic historian, speaking of the Battle of Cressy, which was fought on August 26, 1346, says, Never, perhaps, were preparations for battle made under circumstances so truly awful. On that very day the sun suffered a partial eclipse. Birds in clouds, precursors of a storm, flew screaming over the two armies, and the rain fell in torrents, accompanied with incessant thunder and lightning. About five in the afternoon the weather cleared up, the sun in full splendor darted his rays in the eyes of the enemy, and the Genoese, setting up their shouts, discharged their quarrels. This was not an eclipse, for none was due to take place, and the phenomenon could only have been meteorological. Dense clouds or something of that sort in the sky. On June 16, 1406, there was a large eclipse of the sun, nine-tenths of its diameter being covered at London, but on the continent it seems to have been total. It is stated that the darkness was such that people could hardly recognize one another. One of the most celebrated eclipses during the Middle Ages was undoubtedly that of June 17, 1433. This was long remembered in Scotland as the Black Hour, and its circumstances were fully investigated some years ago by Hind. It was a remarkable eclipse in that the moon was within thirteen degrees of perigee, and the sun only two degrees from apogee. The central line traversed Scotland in a southeasterly direction, from Ross to Forfar, passing near Inverness and Dundee, 
McLaren, who lived in the early part of the last century, mentions that in his time a manuscript account of this eclipse was preserved in the library of the University of Edinburgh, wherein the darkness is said to have come on at about 3 p.m. and to have been very profound. The duration of the totality at Inverness was 4 minutes 32 seconds, at Edinburgh 3 minutes 41 seconds. The central line passed from Britain to the north of Frankfurt on the main, through Bavaria, to the Dardanelles, to the south of Aleppo, and thence nearly parallel to the river Euphrates, to the northeast border of Arabia. In Turkey, according to Calvisius, near evening the light of the sun was so overpowered that darkness covered the land. In 1544, on January 24th, there occurred an eclipse of the sun which was nearly but not quite total. The chief interest arises from the fact that it was one of the first observed by professed astronomers. Gemma Frisius saw it at Louvain. Kepler says that the day became dark like the twilight of evening and that the birds which from the break of day had been singing became mute. The middle of the eclipse was at about 9 a.m. In 1560 an eclipse of the sun took place which was total in Spain and Portugal. Calvius, who observed it at Coimbra, says that the sun remained obscured for no little time. There was darkness greater than that of night. No one could see where he trod, and the stars shone very brightly in the sky. The birds, moreover, wonderful to say, fell down to the ground in fright at such startling darkness. Kepler is responsible for the statement that Tycho Brahe did not believe this, and wrote to Calvius to that effect forty years afterwards. In 1567 there was an annular eclipse visible at Rome on April 9th. Calvius says that the whole sun was not eclipsed, but that there was left a bright circle all around. This in set terms is a description of an annular eclipse, but Johnson, who calculated that at Rome the greatest obscuration took place at twenty minutes past noon, points out that the augmentation of the moon's semi-diameter would almost have produced totality. Tycho tells us that he saw this eclipse on the shores of the Baltic when a young man about twenty years of age. The total eclipse of February twenty fifth, 1598 long left a special mark on the memories of the people of Scotland. The day was spoken of as Black Saturday. McLaren states, There is a tradition that some persons in the north lost their way in the time of this eclipse, and perished in the snow, a statement which Hines discredits. The central line passed from near Stranraer over Dalkeith, and therefore Edinburgh was within the zone of totality. Totality came on at Edinburgh at 10 hours 15 minutes, and lasted 1 minute 30 seconds. From the rapid motion of the moon and declination, the course of the central line was a quickly ascending one in latitude on the Earth's surface, the totality passing off within the Arctic Circle. Kepler, in his account of the new star in the constellation, Ophiuchus refers to the total eclipse of the sun of October 12, 1605, as having been observed at Naples, and that the red flames were visible as a rim of red light round the sun's disk. At least this seems to be the construction which may fairly be put upon the Latin of the original description. The partial eclipse of the sun of May 30, 1612 is recorded to have been seen through a tube. No doubt this is an allusion to the newly invented instrument which we now call the telescope. Seemingly this is the first eclipse of the sun so observed, but it is on record that an eclipse of the moon had been previously observed through a telescope. This was the lunar eclipse of July 6, 1610, though the observer's name has not been handed down to us. The eclipse of April 8, 1652, is another of those Scotch eclipses, as we may call them, which left their mark on the people of that country. McLaren speaks of it in his time, he died in 1746, as one of the two central eclipses which are still famous among the populace in this country, Scotland and known amongst them by the appellation of Mirk Monday. The central line passed over the southeast of Ireland near Wexford and Wicklow, and reaching Scotland near Burrowhead in Wigtonshire, and passing not far from Edinburgh, Montrose, and Aberdeen, quitted Scotland at Peterhead. Greenock and Elgin were near the northern limit of the zone of totality, and the Cheviots and Berwick upon the southern limit. The eclipse was observed at Carrickfergus by Dr. Wyberd. Hind found that its duration there was but 44 seconds. In 
This short duration, he suggested, may partly explain the curious remark of Dr. Wyberd that when the sun was reduced to a very slender crescent of light, the moon all at once threw herself within the margin of the solar disk with such agility that she seemed to revolve like an upper millstone, affording a pleasant spectacle of rotatory motion. Wyberd's further description clearly applies to the corona. A Scotch account says that the country people tilling loosed their ploughs. The birds dropped to the ground. The eclipse of November 4, 1668, visible as a partial one in England, was of no particular interest in itself, but deserves notice as having been observed by Flamsteed, who gives a few diagrams of his observations at Derby. He states that the eclipse came on much earlier than had been predicted. It was well known at this time that the tables of the sun and moon then in use were very defective, and it was a recognition of this fact which eventually led to the foundation of the Greenwich Observatory in 1675. On September 23, 1699, an eclipse of the sun occurred which was total to the north of Caithness for the very brief space of 10 to 15 seconds. At Edinburgh, about 11 twelfths of the sun's diameter was obscured. In the appendix to Pepys' diary, there is a letter from Dr. Wallace mentioning that his daughter's attention was called to it by noticing the light of the sun looked somewhat dim at about 9 a.m., whilst she was writing a letter, she knowing nothing of the eclipse. An eclipse of the sun occurred on May 12, 1706, which was visible as a partial eclipse in England, and was total on the continent, especially in Switzerland. A certain Captain Stanyan, who made observations at Bern, writes thus to Flamsteed, that the sun was totally darkened there for four and a half minutes of time, that a fixed star and a planet appeared very bright, and that his getting out of his eclipse was preceded by a blood-red streak of light from its left limb, which continued not longer than six or seven seconds of time. Then part of the sun's disk appeared all of a sudden as bright as Venus was ever seen in the night. Nay, brighter, and in that very instant gave a light and shadow to things as strong as the moon uses to do. On this communication Flamsteed remarks, the captain is the first man I ever heard of that took notice of a red streak preceding the immersion of the sun's body from a total eclipse, and I take notice of it to you, the Royal Society, because it infers that the moon has an atmosphere, and its short continuance, if only six or seven seconds' time, tells us that its height was not more than five or six hundredths part of her diameter. On the whole, perhaps, the most celebrated eclipse of the sun ever recorded in England was that of May 3, 1715. The line of totality passed right across England from Cornwall to Norfolk, and the phenomenon was carefully observed and described by the most experienced astronomer of the time, Dr. Edmund Haley. The line of totality passed over London, amongst other places, and as the maximum phase took place soon after 9 a.m. on a fine spring morning, the inhabitants of the metropolis saw a sight which their successors will not see again till many generations have come and gone. Haley has left behind him an exceedingly interesting account of this event, some allusions to which have already been made. He seems to have seen what we call the corona, described by him, however, as a luminous ring of a pale whiteness, or rather pearl color, a little tinged with the colors of the iris, and concentric with the moon. He speaks also of a dusky but strong red light, which seemed to color the dark edge of the moon just before the sun emerged from totality. Jupiter, Mercury, Venus, and the stars Capella and Aldebaran were seen in London, whilst north of London, more directly under the central line, as many as twenty stars were seen. The inhabitants of England who lived in the reign of George I were singularly fortunate in their chances of seeing total eclipses of the sun, for only nine years after the one just described, namely on May 22, 1724, another total eclipse occurred. The central line crossed some of the southern countries, and the phenomenon was well seen and reported on by Dr. Stukeley, who stationed himself on Harridan Hill near Salisbury. The doctor says of the darkness that he seemed to feel it, as it were, drop upon us, like a great dark mantle, and that during the totality the spectacle presented to his view was beyond all that he had ever seen or could picture to his imagination, the most solemn. He could with difficulty discern the faces of his companions which had a ghastly, startling appearance. When the totality was ending there appeared a small lucid spot, and from it ran a rim of faint brightness. In about three and a half minutes from this appearance the hilltops changed from black to blue, 
the horizon gave out the gray streaks previous to morning dawn and the birds sprang joyously into the air this eclipse seems to have had royal observers it was watched at kensington apparently by the king or some of the royal family of england and at trianon paris by the king of france under the competent guidance of Miraldi, cassini and de Louville. it was the last which was visible as a total one in any part of england on may second seventeen thirty three there was an eclipse of the sun which was total in sweden and partial in england in sweden the total obscuration lasted more than three minutes jupiter the stars in ursa major capella and several other stars were visible to the naked eye as also was a luminous ring round the sun three or four spots of reddish color were also perceived near the limb of the moon but not in immediate contact with it these so-called red spots were doubtless the red flames of the present century and the luminous ring the corona on march the first seventeen thirty seven a good annular eclipse was observed at edinburgh by mclaren in his account he says a little before the annulus was complete a remarkable point or speck of pale light appeared near the middle of the part of the moon's circumference that was not yet come upon the disk of the sun during the appearance of the annulus the direct light of the sun was still very considerable but the places that were shaded from his light appeared gloomy there was a dusk in the atmosphere especially toward the north and east in those chambers which had not their lights westwards the obscurity was considerable venus appeared plainly and continued visible long after the annulus was dissolved and i am told that other stars were seen by some lord abadar mentions a narrow streak of dusky red light on the dark edge of the moon immediately before the ring was completed and after it was dissolved no doubt this is a record of the red flames in seventeen forty eight scotland was again favored with a central eclipse but it was only annular the earl of morton and james short the optician who observed the phenomenon at aberdour castle ten miles northwest of edinburgh just outside the line of annularity saw a brown-colored light stretching along the circumference of the moon from each of the cusps a star probably the planet venus was seen to the east of the sun the annular eclipse of april the first seventeen sixty four visible as such in north kent was the subject of the following quaint letter by the rev dr stukeley to the printer of whitehall evening post in regard to the approaching solar eclipse of sunday april the first i think it advisable to remark that it happening in the time of divine service it is desired you would insert this caution in your public paper the eclipse begins soon after nine the middle a little before eleven the end a little after twelve there will be no total darkness in the very middle observable in this metropolis but as people's curiosities will not be over with the middle of the eclipse if the church service be ordered to begin a little before twelve it will properly be morning prayer and a uniformity preserved in our duty to the supreme being the author of these amazing celestial movements yours rector of st george q s the year seventeen sixty six furnishes the somewhat rare case of a total eclipse of the sun observed on board ship on the high seas the observers were officers of the french man-of-war the comte d'artois though the total obscuration lasted only fifty-three seconds there was seen a luminous ring about the moon which had four remarkable expansions situated a distance of ninety degrees from each other these expansions are doubtless those rays which we now speak of as streamers from the corona curiously enough the next important total eclipse deserving of notice was also observed at sea this was the eclipse of june twenty fourth seventeen seventy eight the observer was the spanish admiral don antonio ulloa who was passing from the azores to cape st vincent the total obscuration lasted four minutes the luminous ring presented a very beautiful appearance out of it there issued forth rays of light which reached to the distance of a diameter of the moon before it became very conspicuous stars of the first and second magnitudes were distinctly visible but when it attained its greatest brilliancy only stars of the first magnitude could be perceived the darkness was such that persons who were asleep and happened to wake thought that they had slept the whole evening and only waked when the night was pretty far advanced the fowls birds and other animals on board took their usual position for sleeping as if it had been night on september fifth seventeen ninety three there happened an eclipse which annular to the north of scotland was seen and observed in england by sir w herschel as a partial eclipse 
He made some important observations on the moon on this occasion, measuring the height of several of the lunar mountains. Considerations respecting the shape of one of the moon's horns led him to form an opinion adverse to the idea that there the moon had an atmosphere. End of chapter 12 Recording by Philip Gould Chapter 13 of The Story of Eclipses This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Story of Eclipses by George Chambers Chapter 13 Eclipses of the Sun During the Nineteenth Century Observations of total solar eclipses during the nineteenth century have been, for the most part, carried on under circumstances so essentially different from everything that has gone before, that not only does a new chapter seem desirable, but also new form of treatment. Up to the beginning of the eighteenth century the observations, even the best of them, may be said to have been made and recorded with but few exceptions by unskilled observers with no clear ideas as to what they should look for and what they might expect to see. Things improved a little during the eighteenth century in the observations by Haley, McLaren, Bradley, Don Antonio Ulloa, Sir W. Herschel, and others in particular rose to a much higher standard than any which had preceded them. However, it has only been during the nineteenth century, and especially during the latter half of it, that the total eclipses of the sun have been observed under circumstances calculated to extract from them large and solid extensions of scientific knowledge. Inasmuch as it has been deemed convenient to sort out and classify our knowledge under particular heads in previous chapters, I shall in this chapter speak only of the leading facts of each eclipse in such an outline form as will avoid as far as possible unnecessary repetition. In 1806 a total eclipse of the sun occurred visible in North America. Observations made in the United States have been handed down to us. Don Joaquin Ferrer, a Spanish astronomer, observed the eclipse at Kinderhook in the state of New York. The totality lasted more than four and a half minutes, a somewhat unusual length of time. One or two planets and a few first magnitude stars were seen. During the totality there was a slight fall of dew. On November 19, 1816, there occurred the first total eclipse of the sun in the 19th century, the central line of which passed over Europe. There was only one known observation of the total phase, and this was by Hagen at Kolm in Bohemia, but he appears to have seen only the beginning of the totality and not the whole of it. A partial eclipse of the sun visible as such in England, but which was annular in the Shetland Islands, took place on September 7, 1820. The only reason why this is worth mention is for its political associations. The trial of Queen Caroline was going on in the House of Lords, and the House suspended its sitting for a short time for the sake of the eclipse. On May 15, 1836, there occurred an annular eclipse of the sun, which, though it was nowhere total, may be looked upon as the first of the modern eclipses, the observations of which have taken such a great development during recent years. The annularity of this eclipse was observed in the north of England and in the south of Scotland and it was at Jedburgh in Roxburghshire that Mr. Francis Bailey observed that feature of eclipses of the sun now universally known as Bailey's beads. Some indications of the red flames were also obtained at places where the eclipse was annular. Probably it was the recognition of Bailey's beads as a regular concomitant of eclipses of the sun which helped to pave the way for the extensive preparations made in France, Italy, Austria, and Russia for observing the total eclipse of July 8, 1842. Many of the most eminent astronomers of Europe repaired to different stations on the central line in order to see the phenomenon. Amongst these may be named Arago, Valls, Airy, Carlini, Santini, and O. Struva. The eclipse was witnessed under favorable circumstances at all the various stations on the central line across Europe from Perpignan in France in the west to Lipetsk in Russia in the east. Arago wrote such an exceedingly graphic account of this eclipse from what may be termed the standpoint of the general public that I will quote it at some length because with an alteration of date it might be rewritten and applied to every total eclipse visible in much populated tracts of country. At Perpignan persons who were seriously unwell alone remained within doors. As soon as day began to break, the population covered the terraces and battlements of the town, 
as well as all the little eminences in the neighborhood, in hopes of obtaining a view of the sun as he ascended above the horizon. At the citadel we had under our eyes, besides numerous groups of citizens established on the slopes, a body of soldiers about to be reviewed. The hour of the commencement of the eclipse drew nigh. More than twenty thousand persons with smoke glasses in their hands were examining the radiant globe projected upon an azure sky. Although armed with our powerful telescopes, we had hardly begun to discern the small notch on the western limb of the sun, when an immense exclamation, formed by the blending together of twenty thousand different voices, announced to us that we had anticipated by only a few seconds the observation made with the unaided eye by twenty thousand astronomers equipped for the occasion, whose first essay this was. A lively curiosity, a spirit of emulation, the desire of not being outdone, had the privilege of giving to the natural vision an unusual power of penetration. During the interval that elapsed between this moment and the almost total disappearance of the sun, we remarked nothing worthy of relation in the countenances of so many spectators. But when the sun, reduced to a very narrow filament, began to throw upon the horizon only a very feeble light, a sort of uneasiness seized upon all. Every person felt a desire to communicate his impressions to those around him. Hence arose a deep murmur, resembling that sent forth by the distant ocean after a tempest. The hum of voices increased in intensity as the solar crescent grew more slender. At length the crescent disappeared. Darkness suddenly succeeded light, and an absolute silence marked this phase of the eclipse, with as great precision as did the pendulum of our astronomical clock. The phenomenon in its magnificence had triumphed over the petulance of youth, over the levity which certain persons assume as a sign of superiority, over the noisy indifference of which soldiers usually make profession. A profound stillness also reigned in the air. The birds had ceased to sing. After an interval of solemn expectation which lasted about two minutes, transports of joy, shouts of enthusiastic applause, saluted with the same accord, the same spontaneous feeling, the first reappearance of the rays of the sun to a condition of melancholy produced by sentiments of an indefinable nature there succeeded a lively and intelligible feeling of satisfaction which no one sought to escape from or moderate the impulses of to the majority of the public the phenomenon had arrived at its term the other phases of the eclipse had few attentive spectators beyond the persons devoted especially to astronomical pursuits the total eclipse of July 28, 1851 may be said to have been the first which was the subject of an eclipse expedition, a phrase which of late years has become exceedingly familiar. The total phase was visible in Norway and Sweden, and great numbers of astronomers from all parts of Europe flocked to those countries. Among those who went from England were Sir G. B. Airy, the Astronomer Royal, then Mr. Airy, Mr. J. R. Hind, and Mr. Lassell. The red flames were very much in evidence, and the fact that they belonged to the sun and not to the moon was clearly established. Hind mentions that the aspect of nature during the total eclipse was grand beyond description. This feature is dwelt upon with more than usual emphasis in many of the published accounts. I have never seen it suggested that the mountainous character of the country may have had something to do with it, but that idea would seem not improbable. In the year 1858, two central eclipses of the sun occurred, both presenting some features of interest. That of March 15th was annular, the central line passing across England from Lyme Regis in Dorsetshire to the Wash, traversing portions of Somersetshire, Wiltshire, Berkshire, Oxfordshire, Northamptonshire, Lincolnshire, and Norfolk. The weather generally was unfavorable, and the annular phase was only observed at a few places but important meteorological observations were made and yielded results as regards the diminution of temperature, which were very definite. All over the country rooks and pigeons were seen returning home during the greatest obscuration. Starlings in many places took flight. At Oxford a thrush commenced its evening song. At Ventnor a fish in an aquarium, ordinarily visible in the evening only, was in full activity about the time of greatest gloom and generally it was noted that the birds stopped singing and flew low from bush to bush. The darkness, though nowhere intense, was everywhere very appreciable and decided. The second central eclipse of 1858 took place on September 7th and was observed in Peru by Lieutenant Gillis of the U.S. Navy. 
the totality only lasted one minute and the general features of a total eclipse do not appear to have been very conspicuously visible gillis remarks two citizens of almost stood within a few feet of me watching in silence and with ancient countenances the rapid and fearful decrease of light they were wholly ignorant that any sudden effect would follow the total obscuration of the sun at that instant one exclaimed in terror la gloria and both i believe fell to their knees filled with awe they appreciated the resemblance of the corona to the halos with which the old masters have encircled their ideals of the heads of our saviour and the madonna and devoutly regarded this as a manifestation of the divine presence the year eighteen sixty saw the departure from england of the first great ship expedition to see an eclipse one was due to happen on july eighteenth and a large party went out from england to spain in the h m s himalaya mr de la rue took a very well equipped photographic detachment and his photographs were eminently successful this eclipse settled forever the doubt as to whether the red flames belonged to the sun or the moon and in favor of the former view the years eighteen sixty eight eighteen sixty nine and eighteen seventy were each marked by total eclipses which were observed to a greater or less extent in the first named year the eclipse occurred on august eighteenth the central line passing across india the weather was not everywhere favorable but several expeditions were dispatched to the east indies the spectroscope was largely brought into play with the immediate result of showing that the corona was to be deemed a sort of atmosphere of the sun not self-luminous but shining by reflected light the eclipse of eighteen sixty nine was observed by several well-equipped parties in the united states and a very complete series of excellent photographs was obtained to view the eclipse of december twenty second eighteen seventy several expeditions were dispatched the central line passing over some very accessible places in spain sicily and north africa the english observers went chiefly in h m s urgent though some of them travelled overland to sicily the expenses both of the sea and land parties were to a large extent defrayed by her majesty's government it deserves to be noted that so great was the anxiety of the french astronomer jansen to see this eclipse that he determined to try and escape in a balloon from paris then besieged by the germans and succeeded carrying his instruments with him the weather seriously interfered with the work of all the observers who went out to see this eclipse which was the more to be regretted because the preparations had been on a very extensive and costly scale the chief result was that it was ascertained that the red flames henceforward generally called prominences are composed of hydrogen gas in an incandescent state the year eighteen seventy one saw on december twelfth another indian eclipse noteworthy for the numerous and excellent photographs which were obtained of the corona of the rifts in it and of the general details which were well recorded on the plates there was an eclipse visible in south africa on april sixteenth eighteen seventy four some useful naked eye views were obtained and recorded but as no photographic work was done this eclipse cannot be said to come into line with those which preceded or followed it in the following year that is to say on april sixth eighteen seventy five there was a total eclipse of the sun visible in the far east especially siam but the distance from england coupled with the very generally unfavorable weather prevented this from being anything more than a second-class total eclipse so to speak although extensive preparations had been made and the sum of a thousand pounds had been granted by the british government towards the expenses a certain number of photographs were obtained but none of any very great value perhaps of the next eclipse which we have to consider it may be said that the circumstances were more varied than those of any other during the second half of the nineteenth century the eclipse in question occurred on july twenty ninth eighteen seventy eight several favorable circumstances concurred to make it a notable event in the first place the central line passed entirely across the united states in other words across a long stretch of inhabited and civilized territory accessible from both sides to a nation well provided with the requisite scientific skill and material resources of every kind but there was another special and rare facility available the central line crossed the chain of the rocky mountains an elevated locality which an american writer speaks of as overhung by skies of such limpid clearness that on several evenings jupiter's satellites were seen with the naked eye on the summit of a certain peak known as pike's peak a party of skilled observers headed by professor langley observed the wonderful developments of the corona mentioned on a previous page 
The fact that such a display came under the eyes of man was no doubt mainly due to the superbly clear atmosphere through which the observations were made. That this is not a mere supposition may be inferred from the fact that at the lower elevation of only 8,000 feet, instead of 14,000 feet, the coronal streamers were seen by Professor Newcomb's party far less extended than Langley saw them. Perhaps the best proof of the importance of a diaphanous sky is to be found in the fact that on the summit of Pike's Peak the corona remained visible for fully four minutes after the total phase had come to an end. A comparison of the description shows that even at the elevation of 10,200 feet the observers placed there, whilst they were better off than those at 8,000 feet, assuredly did not see so much or so well as those at 14,000 feet. There occurred a total eclipse on July 11, 1880 visible in California, but as the totality lasted only 32 seconds and the sun's elevation was only 11 degrees, not much was got out of this eclipse notwithstanding that it was observed in a cloudless sky at a station 6,000 feet above the sea. The eclipse of May 17, 1882 yielded several interesting and important features although the totality was short, only about one and a quarter minutes. Here again favorable local circumstances helped astronomers in more ways than one. It was in Egypt that the eclipse was visible, and Egypt is a country which it is exceedingly easy for travelers to reach, and it is also noted for its clear skies. These were doubtless two of the reasons which combined to inspire the elaborate preparations which were made for photographic and spectroscopic observations. The former resulted in a very unprecedented success. One of Dr. Schuster's photographs of the totality showed not only the expected corona, but an unexpected comet. Though on more than one previous occasion in history, the darkness, which is a special accompaniment of a total eclipse, had caused a comet to be seen, yet the 1882 eclipse was the first at which a comet had thrust itself upon the notice of astronomers by means of a photographic plate. It will be remembered that the political circumstances of Egypt in 1882 were of a somewhat strained character and probably this contributed to the development of an unusual amount of astronomical competition in connection with this eclipse. Not only did the Egyptian government grant special facilities, but strong parties went out representing England, France, and Italy, although not perhaps in set terms at the direct instigation of their respective governments. The next eclipse, that of May 6, 1883, had some dramatic features about it. To begin with, its duration was unusually long, nearly five and a half minutes, and Mrs. Todd, in her genial American style, remarks, after the frequent manner of its kind, the path lay where it would be least useful, across the wind-swept wastes of the Pacific. But fortunately one of a small group of coral islands lay quite in its line and nothing daunted, the brave scientific men set their faces towards this friendly cluster, in cheerful faith that they could locate there. Directed to take up their abode somewhere on a diminutive island about which nothing could be ascertained beforehand save the bare fact of its existence at a known spot in mid-ocean, the American observers were absent from the United States more than three months most of which time was spent in traveling 15,000 miles in all, with ten full weeks at sea. Their tiny foothold in the Pacific was Caroline Island, a coral atoll on the outskirts of the Marquesas group. In spite of the unattractive, not to say forbidding, character of the place to which they would have to go, parties of astronomers went out from England, France, Austria, and Italy, and although rain fell on the morning of the day, the sky became quite clear by the time of totality and the observations were completely successful. One of the pictures of the corona obtained by Trouvelot, an observer of French descent but belonging to the American party, has been often reproduced in books and exhibited the corona in a striking form. How few were the attractions of Caroline Island as an eclipse station may be judged from the fact that the inhabitants consisted of only four native men one woman, and two children who lived in three houses and two sheds. On September 8, 1885, there occurred a total eclipse, which was seen as such in New Zealand, but the observations were few and with one exception unimportant and uninteresting. A certain Mr. Graydon, however, made a sketch which showed at one point a complete break in the corona, so that from the very edge of the moon outwards into space there was a long and narrow black space showing nothing but a vacuity. If this was really the condition of things, such a break in the corona is apparently quite unprecedented. 
In 1886, on August 29th, there occurred a total eclipse visible in the West Indies, which yielded various important results. It was unfortunate that for the greater part of its length the zone of totality covered ocean and not land, the only land being the island of Grenada and some adjacent parts of South America. The resulting restriction as regards choice of observing stations was the more to be regretted because the duration of the totality was so unusually long and therefore favorable, being more than six and a half minutes in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. Parties of English, American, and Italian astronomers assembled, however, at Grenada, and though the weather was not the best possible, some interesting photographs were obtained which exhibited an unusual development of hydrogen protuberances. The central line in this eclipse not only stretched right across the Atlantic, but entered Africa on the west coast where a missionary saw the eclipse as a mere spectator, and afterwards expressed his regret that no astronomers were within reach with instruments to record the remarkable corona, which was displayed to his gaze. Though the unusual opportunities which so far as the sun and the moon were concerned were afforded by the eclipse of 1886 were lost, astronomers looked out hopefully for August 19, 1887, when another eclipse was due to happen, which, weather permitting, would be observable over a very long stretch of land, from Berlin through Russia and Siberia to Japan. Unusually extensive preparations were made in Russia at one end and in Japan at the other, but clouds prevailed very generally, and the pictures of the corona which were obtained fell far short in number and quality from what had been hoped for. Having regard to the number and importance of the stations chosen, and of the astronomers who made their preparations thereat, an enthusiastic Russian, in the hope of emancipating himself from the risks of terrestrial weather at the Earth's surface, went up in a balloon to an elevation of more than two miles. His enthusiasm was so far rewarded that he had a very clear view of a magnificent corona. But, as owing to some mischance, the balloon rose, conveying only the astronomer and leaving behind his assistant who was to have managed the balloon. All his time was engrossed by the management of the balloon, and he could do very little in the way of purely astronomical work. The year 1889 afforded two total eclipses of the sun for which the usual preparations were made. The first occurred on New Year's Day, and the path of the shadow crossed the North American continent from California to Manitoba. The weather was nearly everywhere very favorable, and an enormous number of observers and instruments were assembled along the central line. The consequence was that a very large number of photographs were obtained. It may be said generally of this eclipse that as it coincided with a sunspot minimum, it left us in a position to learn very distinctly what are the characteristic features of a solar corona at a period which is one of rest and repose on the sun, at least so far as regards visible sunspots. The second eclipse of 1889 occurred on December 22nd, and should have been visible off the northern coast of South America and on the west coast of Africa. Attempts were made to utilize the South American chances by English and American parties, whilst a small expedition comprising astronomers of both nations went to Cape Lido in West Africa. The African efforts failed entirely owing to clouds, but the South American parties at Cayenne were successful. One very deplorable result, however, arising out of the expedition to Cayenne, was the illness and subsequent death of the Rev. S. J. Perry, S. J., who was struck down by malaria and died at sea on the return journey. None who knew Mr. Perry personally could fail to realize what a loss he was both to astronomy generally and to his own circle of friends particularly. On April 16, 1893, there happened a total eclipse of the sun which was successfully watched by a large number of skilled observers throughout its entire length. Indeed, it is believed that only one party was unsuccessful. The line of totality started on the coast of Chile, passed over the highlands of that country across the borders of Argentina and Paraguay, and over the vast plains and forests of central Brazil, emerging at about noon of local time at a short distance to the northwest of Ceara on the North Atlantic seaboard. Crossing the Atlantic nearly at its narrowest part, it struck the coast of Africa north of the river Gambia, and finally disappeared somewhere in the Sahara. The South American observations were the most extensive and successful, the latter fact being due to the circumstance that the sky at many of the principal stations was preeminently favorable, owing to the clearness and dryness of the atmosphere. On September 29, 1894, there was a total eclipse of the sun, 
but as its duration was brief and the zone of totality lay chiefly over the Indian Ocean, practically nothing came of it. Things seemed, however, much more promising for the total eclipse of August 9, 1896, and a very large number of observers went out to the north of Norway, hoping to catch the shadow at its European end, whilst a yacht party went to Nova Zembla in the Arctic Ocean, and a few observers travelled as far as Japan. So far as the very large number of would-be observers who went from England to Norway were concerned, the eclipse was a profound disappointment, for owing to bad weather practically nothing was seen in Norway except on the west coast near Bodo, where the weather was beautifully fine but where no adequate preparations had been made because nobody believed that the coast would be free from fog. Exceptionally fine weather prevailed at Nova Zembla, and the small but select party who were kindly taken there by the late Sir G. B. Powell, M. P. and his yacht, were very fortunate, and an excellent series of photographs was secured. One important result obtained at Nova Zembla was a full confirmation by Mr. Shackleton of Professor Young's discovery in 1870 of the reversing layer, a discovery which was long and vehemently disputed by Sir Norman Lockyer. Fairly successful observations were made of this eclipse in Siberia and Japan. The last total eclipse of the sun which has to be noticed as an accomplished fact was the Indian eclipse of January 22, 1898, which was very successfully seen by large numbers of people who went to India from all parts of the world. As usual in all total eclipses of the sun nowadays, the photographers were very much to the front, and the photographs of the inner corona taken by the Astronomer Royal are thought to have been probably the best that have yet been done. Amongst the miscellaneous observations made, it may be mentioned that more stars were seen during the second partial phases than during totality a circumstance which had been noted by don a ulloa as far back as seventeen seventy eight it is stated also that a mysterious object was seen between mars and venus by two officers of the h m s melpomene which was not put down on the published chart as a star to be looked for the identity of this object has not been ascertained end of chapter thirteen recording by philip gould Chapter 14 of the Story of Eclipses. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Olson Fytak, Los Angeles. The Story of Eclipses by George Chambers. Chapter 14 The Electric Telegraph as Applied to Eclipses of the Sun. Amongst the auxiliary agencies which have been brought into use in recent years to enable astronomers the better to carry out systematic observations of eclipses of the sun, the electric telegraph occupies a place which may hereafter become prominent. As it is not likely that this little book will fall into the hands of any persons who would be able to make much use of telegraphy in connection with eclipse observations, it will not be necessary to give much space to the matter, but a few outlines will certainly be interesting. When the idea of utilizing the telegraph wire first came into men's minds, it was with the object of enabling observers who saw the commencement of an eclipse at one end of the line of totality to give cautionary notices to observers farther on or towards the far end of special points which had been seen at the beginning of the totality and as to which confirmatory observations at a later hour were evidently very desirable it is obvious that a scheme of this kind depends for its success upon each end or something like it of the line of totality being in telegraphic communication with the other end and this involves a combination of favourable circumstances not likely to exist at every occurrence of a total eclipse and in general only likely to prevail in the case of eclipses visible over inhabited territory such as the two americas europe and parts of asia this use of the telegraph was i think first proposed as far back as eighteen seventy eight by an american astronomer in connection with the total eclipse of that year 
his proposal fell upon sympathetic ears with the result that arrangements were concluded with the western union telegraph company of north america for the expeditious forwarding of messages from northern stations on the eclipse line to southern stations some attention was being given at that time to the question of intramercurial planets and it was thought that if by good fortune any such objects were unexpectedly found at the northern station and observers at a southern station could be advised of the fact there might be a better chance of procuring an accurate and precise record of the discovery as it happened nothing came of it on that occasion but the idea of utilizing the telegraph having once taken possession of men's minds it was soon seen what important possibilities were opened up the want of telegraph organization curiously made itself felt in the egyptian eclipse of eighteen eighty two it is stated in another chapter of this work that during the total phase a comet was unexpectedly discovered now comets sometimes move very rapidly especially when they are near the sun and had it been possible to have warned some observer to the east of egypt to look out for this comet and had he seen it even only a couple of hours after it had been found in egypt some data respecting its position might have been obtained which would have permitted a rough estimate being formed of its movement through the heavens such an estimate might have enabled astronomers to have hunted up the comet at sunset or sunrise on the days immediately following the eclipse as it happened however the comet was not seen again in eighteen eighty two and so far as we know may never be seen again it was not till eighteen eighty nine that a complete organization of a telegraph service in connection with an eclipse was accomplished the eclipse of january first of that year began in the pacific and the line of totality touched land in california passing across north america to manitoba the first californian station was at willows and was occupied by a party from harvard college observatory who were supplied with an unusually complete equipment of photographic apparatus together with a large camera for charting all the stars in the neighborhood of the sun so as to detect an intramercurial planet if one existed the telegraph scheme which had to be worked out was somewhat complicated and one of the chief actors in the scene has furnished a fairly full account of what was done first of all a complete list of the instruments and of the work proposed to be done by them had to be prepared the weather probabilities being everywhere very unsatisfactory there was a possibility of all degrees of success or failure and one thing which had to be prearranged for each station was a cipher code which should be available for all the likely combinations of instruments weather and results it was found that about one hundred words would suffice for the necessary code including words which would indicate in a sufficiently precise manner the position of any new planet which a photograph might disclose the following being a part of the code prescribed for use at willows will serve to indicate the nature of the whole scheme africa perfectly clear throughout the whole eclipse alaska perfectly clear during totality belgium clear sky for the partial phases but cloudy for totality bolivia entirely cloudy throughout the whole eclipse brazil observed all the contacts bremen observed three of the contacts ceylon made observations on the shadow bands chile observed lines of the reversing layer visually china 
the corona showed great detail cork obtained forty to fifty negatives during totality corsica obtained fifty to sixty negatives during totality crimea obtained sixty to seventy negatives during totality cuba observed a comet upwards of twenty codes were prepared for the like number of stations and the observers were to report their results at the earliest possible moment on a rehearsal of the program the thought occurred that the sending and reception of so many cipher messages in the ordinary course of business might lead to delays which would be productive of serious inconvenience and that the success of the whole scheme could be only well assured if a special wire in direct circuit from new york to the eclipse stations in turn could be dedicated to the work thanks to the liberality of the western union telegraph company this privilege was secured and a branch wire was led across from the company's new york office to the office of the new york herald which journal had undertaken to be responsible for the non-astronomical part of the business mrs todd gives the following account of the final arrangements and of how they began to work when the moment for action arrived from san francisco every california observer was within easy telegraphic reach and the wire thus extended by direct circuit to each eclipse station in turn from the editorial rooms of the herald professor todd was in immediate communication with any observers whom he chose to call as previously intimated arrangements had been made with the harvard astronomers at willows to receive their message first and with the utmost dispatch in order to test the feasibility of outstripping the moon shortly before five o'clock in the afternoon dispatches began to come in of course a slight delay was unavoidable as the observers at the various stations were some rods distant from the local telegraph offices and it would take a few minutes after the eclipse was over to prepare the suitable message from the cipher code on the astronomer's table in the herald office were a large map and a chronometer the latter indicated exact Greenwich time, and the former showed the correct position of the moon's shadow at the beginning of every minute by the chronometer. In this way, it was possible to follow readily the precise phase of the eclipse at every station. About the rooms, and accessible for immediate use, were arranged the cipher codes pertaining to the several stations and other papers necessary in preparing the reports for the press everything being as was supposed in working order new york about a quarter of an hour before totality commenced inquired of willows the state of the weather the answer was that the sky was getting dark and that there were no clouds anywhere near the sun at that time the moon's shadow was travelling across the open waters of the pacific it rapidly rushed along totality came and went at willows a two minutes glimpse of the corona was had and the corona swept rapidly eastwards after a brief interval professor pickering sent off from willows a telegram which began alaska china corsica and then the connection failed the break was located somewhere between california and utah and more than half an hour elapsed ere the circuit was re-established and the rest of the message received the remainder of the thrilling incidents of that eventful day cannot possibly be better told than in mrs todd's crisp and striking language during this interval the lunar shadow advancing over montana and dakota had left the earth entirely sweeping off again into space still however the prospect that the telegraph might win the race was hopeful had new york been located in the eclipse path as well as willows with both stations symmetrically placed 
the total eclipse would have become visible at new york about an hour and a quarter after the shadow had left california thus there was time to spare having recovered the wire professor pickering's message was completed at ten hours thirty six minutes g m t the cipher translated and the stenographer's notes were written out and dispatched to the composing room six minutes later the copy was quickly put in type and the hurried proof handed to professor todd at ten hours fifty minutes exactly an hour of absolute time after the observations were concluded had the moon's shadow been advancing from california toward new york there was still a margin of several minutes before the eclipse could become total at the latter place in point of fact while the proof sheet of the first message was being read the lunar shadow would have been loitering among the alleghanies man's messenger had thus outrun the moon the telegraphic reports of the other astronomers were gradually gathered and put in type and the forms of the herald were ready for the stereotyper at the proper time some two hours after midnight at three o'clock a m the european mails closed and the pouches put on board the steamship aller carried the usual copies for the foreign circulation within twenty-four hours after the observations of the eclipse were made near the pacific coast the results had been telegraphed to the atlantic seaboard collected and printed and the papers were well out on their journey to european readers the foregoing narrative will make amply clear the future possibilities of telegraphy as a coadjutor of astronomy in the observation of total eclipses of the sun and if the will and the funds are forthcoming the eclipse of may twenty eighth nineteen hundred will afford an excellent opportunity of again putting to the test the excellent ideas of which our american friends worked out so successfully ten years ago the zone of totality in that eclipse passing as it will through so many of the densely populated southern states of north america and then through portugal spain and algiers great facilities will present themselves for telegraphic combinations if political and financial difficulties do not interfere end of chapter fourteen recorded by linda olson fitak los angeles chapter fifteen of the story of eclipses this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kathleen. The Story of Eclipses by George Chambers. Eclipses of the Moon. General Principles. In dealing with eclipses generally, but with more especial reference to eclipses of the sun in a previous chapter, it was unavoidable to mix up in some degree eclipses of the moon with those of the sun there are however distinctions between the two phenomena which make it convenient to separate them as much as possible eclipses of the moon are like those of the sun divisible into partial and total eclipses but those words have a different application in regard to eclipses of the moon from what they have when eclipses of the sun are in question a little thought will soon make it clear why this should be the case a partial eclipse of the sun results from the visible body of the sun being in part concealed from us by the solid body of the moon and so in a total eclipse there is a total concealment of the one object by the other but when we come to deal with partial and total eclipses of the moon the situation is materially different the moon becomes invisible by passing into the dark shadows cast by the earth into space figure thirteen will make this clear without the necessity of much verbal explanation s represents the sun e the earth and m n the orbit of the moon it is obvious that whilst the moon is moving from m to n it becomes immersed in the earth's shadow 
but before actually reaching the shadow the moon passes through a point in its orbit at which it begins to lose the full light of the sun this is the entrance into the penumbra or partial shade similarly after the eclipse when the moon has emerged from the full shadow it does not all at once come into full sunshine but again passes through the stage of penumbral illumination and under such circumstances to speak in the style of old o oh, ireland the invisible moon is very often not invisible and the part partially eclipsed is often not eclipsed and when the moon is totally eclipsed it is frequently still visible of course the general idea involved in all cases of a body passing into the shadow of another body is that the body which so passes disappears because all direct light is cut off from it in the case however of a lunar eclipse this state of things is not always literally accomplished and very often some residual light reaches the moon of course from the sun with the result that traces of the moon may often be discerned the laws which govern this matter are very ill understood the fact remains that if we examine a series of reports of observed eclipses of the moon extending over many centuries and records exist which enable us to do this we shall find that in some instances when the moon was totally eclipsed in the technical sense of that word it was still perfectly visible whilst during other eclipses it absolutely and entirely disappeared from view such eclipses are sometimes spoken of as black eclipses of the moon but the phrase is not a happy one many instances of both kinds will be found mentioned in the chapter on historical lunar eclipses the different conditions of eclipses of the moon are illustrated by figure fourteen which must be studied with the aid of the remarks made in a former chapter concerning the apparent movements of the sun and moon and their nodal passages suffice it to state here that in figure fourteen a b represents the elliptic and c d the moon's path the three black circles are imaginary sections of the earth's shadow as cast when the earth is in three successive positions in the elliptic if when the earth's shadow is near a the moon should be at e and in conjunction with the earth the moon will escape eclipse if the conjunction takes place with both the earth's shadow and the moon a little further forward say at f the moon will be partially obscured but if the moon is at or very near its node as at g it will be wholly involved in the earth's shadow and a total eclipse will be the result in the case contemplated at g in the diagram the moon is concentrically placed with respect to the shadow but the eclipse will equally be total even though the two bodies are not concentrically disposed so long as the moon is wholly within the cone of the earth's shadow just as in the case of the sun so with the moon there are certain limits on the elliptic within which eclipses of the moon may take place other narrower limits within which they must take place and again other limits beyond which they cannot take place reverting to what has been said on a previous page with respect to these matters when an eclipse of the sun is in question it is only necessary to substitute for the word conjunction the word opposition and for eighteen and a half degrees and fifteen and a fourth degree of longitude the figures twelve and a half degree and nine and a fourth degree the limits in latitude will be one degree three minutes and zero degree fifty two minutes instead of one degree thirty four minutes and one degree twenty three minutes these substitutions made the general ideas and facts stated with regard to the conditions of an eclipse of the sun will apply also to the one of the moon it is to be noted that whereas eclipses of the sun always begin on the west side of the sun eclipses of the moon begin on the east side of the moon this difference arises from the fact that the sun's movement in the ecliptic is only apparent it being the earth which really moves whilst the moon's movement is real eclipses of the moon 
though more often and more widely visible than eclipses of the sun do not offer by any means the same variety of interesting or striking phenomena to the mere star-gazer and it was long thought that they were in a certain sense of no use to science now however astronomers are inclined to utilize them for determining the diameter of the moon by noting occultations of stars by the moon the duration of a star's invisibility behind an eclipsed moon being a measure of the lunar diameter when such an observation is properly transformed and reduced observations of the heat radiated or rather reflected by an eclipsed moon have also been made with the interesting result of showing that during an eclipse the moon's power to reflect solar heat to the earth sensibly declines the duration of an eclipse of the moon is dependent on its magnitude where the eclipse is total the darkness or what counts for such may last for nearly four hours though this is an extreme limit rarely attained an eclipse of from six to twelve digits to use the old-fashioned nomenclature which has been already explained will continue from two and a half to three and a half hours an eclipse of three to six digits will last two or three hours and a smaller eclipse only one or two hours the visual observations to be made in connection with partial or total eclipses of the moon chiefly relate to the appearances presented by our satellite when immersed in the earth's shadow on such occasions as has been already stated it frequently happens that the moon does not wholly disappear but may be detected either with a telescope or even without one it may exhibit either a dull gray appearance or more commonly a pinkish red hue to which the designation coppery is generally applied perhaps the most remarkable instance of this was the eclipse of march nineteen eighteen forty eight mr forster who observed the phenomena at bruges thus describes what he saw i wish to call your attention to the fact which i have clearly ascertained that during the whole of the late eclipse of march nineteen the shaded surface presented a luminosity quite unusual probably about three times the intensity of the mean illumination of the eclipsed lunar disk the light was of a deep red color during the totality of the eclipse the light and dark spaces on the face of the moon could be almost as well made out as on an ordinary dull moonlight night and the deep red color where the sky was clearer was very remarkable from the contrasted whiteness of the stars my observations were made with different telescopes but all presented the same appearance and the remarkable luminosity struck every one the british consul at ghent who did not know there was an eclipse wrote to me for an explanation of the blood-red color of the moon at nine o'clock on striking contrast to this stands the total eclipse of october fourth eighteen eighty four which is described by mr e j stone as much the darkest that i have ever seen and just before the instant of totality it appeared as if the moon's surface would be invisible to the naked eye during totality but such was not the case for with the last appearance of the bright reflected sunlight there appeared a dim circle of light around the moon's disk and the whole surface became faintly visible and continued so until the end of totality a total eclipse of the moon which happened on january twenty eighth eighteen eighty eight was observed in many places under exceptionally favorable circumstances as regards weather the familiar copper color is spoken of by many observers the rev s j perry makes mention of patches of color even as bright as brick red almost orange in the brighter parts and this twenty minutes before the total phase began mr perry conducted on this occasion spectroscopic observations for the first time on an eclipsed moon but no special results were obtained various explanations have been offered for these diversities of appearance undoubtedly they depend upon differences in the condition of the earth's atmosphere such as the unusual presence or unusual absence of aqueous vapor but it cannot be said that the laws which control these diversities are by any means capable of being plainly enunciated notwithstanding that the explanation generally in vogue dates from as far back as the time of kepler he suggested that the coppery hue was a result of the refraction of the earth's atmosphere 
which had the effect of bending the solar rays passing through it so that they impinged upon the moon even when the earth was actually interposed between the sun and the moon that the outstanding rays which became visible are red may be considered due to the fact that the blue rays are absorbed in passing through the terrestrial atmosphere just as both the eastern and western skies are frequently seen to assume a ruddy hue when illuminated in the morning or evening by the solar rays at or near sunrise or sunset owing to the variable meteorological condition of our atmosphere the actual quantity of light transmitted through it is liable to considerable fluctuations and no wonder therefore that variations occur in the appearances presented by the moon during her immersion in the earth's shadow it has been suggested that if the portion of the earth's atmosphere through which the sun's rays have to pass is tolerably free from aqueous vapor the red rays will be almost wholly absorbed but not the blue rays and the resulting illumination will either only render the moon's surface visible with a grayish blue tinge or not visible at all this will yield the black eclipse to recall the phrase quoted elsewhere if on the other hand the region of the earth's atmosphere through which the sun's rays pass be highly saturated it will be the blue rays which suffer absorption whilst the red rays will be transmitted and will impart a ruddy hue to the moon finally if the earth's atmosphere is in a different condition in different places saturated in some parts and not in others a piebald sort of effect will be the result and some portions of the moon's disk will be invisible whilst others will be more or less illuminated further illustrations of all these three alternatives will be found amongst the eclipses of the moon recorded in the chapter devoted to historical matters a few instances are on record of a curious spectacle connected with the eclipses of the moon which must have a word of mention i refer to the simultaneous visibility of the sun and the moon above the horizon the moon at the time being eclipsed at the first blush of the thing this would seem to be an impossibility remembering that it is a cardinal principle of eclipses both of the sun and of the moon that the three bodies must be in the same straight line in order to constitute an eclipse the anomalous spectacle just referred to is simply the result of the refraction exercised by the earth's atmosphere the setting sun which has actually set has apparently not done so but is displaced upwards by refraction on the other hand the rising moon which has not actually risen is displaced upwards by refraction and so becomes as it were prematurely visible in other words refraction retards the apparent setting of one body the sun and accelerates the apparent rising of the other body the moon the effect of these two displacements will be to bring the two bodies closer by more than one degree of a great circle than they really are this being the conjoint amount of the double displacements due to refraction amateur observers of eclipses of the moon will find some pleasure and profit as well in having before them on the occasion of an eclipse a picture of the moon's surface in diagrammatic form with a few of the principal mountains marked thereon and then watching from time to time say by quarters of an hour the successive encroachments of the earth's shadow on the moon's surface and the gradual covering up of the larger mountains as the shadow moves forward the curved lines represent the gradual progress of the shadow during the eclipse named this diagram ignoring the curved lines actually marked on it may be used over and over again for any number of eclipses simply noting from the nautical almanac or other suitable ephemerides the points on the moon's disk at which the shadow first touches the disk as it comes on and last touches the disk as it goes off the almanac indicates these points by stating that the eclipse begins or ends as the case may be at a point which is so many degrees from the north point of the moon measured round the moon's circumference by the east or by the west as the case may be one other point and we have disposed of eclipses of the moon the shadow which we see creeping over the moon during an eclipse is as we know the shadow cast by the earth 
if we notice it attentively we shall see that its outline is curved and that it is in fact a complete segment of a circle moreover that the circularity of this shadow is maintained from first to last so far as we are able to follow it what is this then but a proof of the rotundity of the earth the shape of the earth's shadow on the moon during a lunar eclipse was suggested as a proof of the rotundity of the earth by two old greek astronomers manilius and cleomedes who lived about two thousand years ago and is one more illustration of the great powers of observation and the general acuteness of the natural philosophers of antiquity end of eclipses of the moon general principles Chapter Sixteen of the Story of Eclipses. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kathleen. The Story of Eclipses by George Chambers. Eclipses of the Moon mentioned in history. We saw in a previous chapter that we owe to the Chinese the first record of an eclipse of the sun it must now be stated that the same remark applies to the first recorded eclipse of the moon and professor s m russell is again our authority he refers to a book called the chu shu or book of the chu dynasty said to have been found in two hundred eighty a d in the tomb of an emperor who lived many centuries previously in this book it is stated that in the thirty-fifth year of wen wang on the day ping chu there was an eclipse of the moon russell finds that this event may be assigned to january twenty ninth eleven thirty six b c and that the eclipse was total next after this chinese eclipse in point of time come several eclipses recorded by ptolemy on the authority of records collected or examined by himself the three earliest of these came from chaldean sources the first of these eclipses was observed at babylon in the twenty-seventh year of the era of nabonassar the first of the reign of mardo Kempedius, on the twenty-ninth of the egyptian month toth answering to march nineteen seven hundred twenty one b c the eclipse began before moonrise and the middle of the totality appears to have occurred at nine hours thirty minutes p m the other two eclipses also observed at babylon occurred on march eight seven hundred twenty b c and september one in the same year respectively three other lunar eclipses recorded by ptolemy assisted sir i newton in fixing the terminus a quo from which the seventy weeks of years were to run which the prophet daniel predicted were to elapse before the death of christ this terminus a quo dates from the restoration of the jews under artaxerxes four hundred fifty seven b c the three eclipses which newton made use of were those of july sixteen five hundred twenty three november nineteen five hundred two and april twenty five four hundred ninety one b c aristophanes in the clouds lines five hundred sixty one to sixty six makes an allusion to which has been supposed but probably without adequate warrant in spineham's opinion to refer to an eclipse of the moon the eclipse october nine four hundred twenty five b c has moreover been suggested as that referred to but the whole idea seems to me too shadowy an eclipse of the moon took place in the fourth year of the ninety first olympiad answering to august twenty seven four hundred thirteen b c which produced very disastrous consequences to an athenian army owing to the ignorance and incapacity of nicias the commander the army was in sicily confronted by a syracusan army and having failed more or less and sickness having broken out it was decided that the athenians should embark and quit the island plutarch in his life of nicias says everything accordingly was prepared for embarkation and the enemy paid no attention to these movements because they did not expect them but in the night there happened an eclipse of the moon at which nicias and all the rest were struck with a great panic either through ignorance or superstition as for an eclipse of the sun which happens at the conjunction even the common people had some idea of its being caused by the interposition of the moon but they could not easily form a conception by the interposition of what body the moon when at the full should suddenly lose her light and assume such a variety of colors 
they looked upon it therefore as a strange and preternatural phenomenon a sign by which the gods announced some great calamity and the calamity came to pass but only indirectly was it caused by the moon plutarch and pliny both mentioned that eleven days before the victory of alexander over darius at arbella in assyria there was an eclipse of the moon plutarch's words life of alexander are that there happened an eclipse of the moon about the beginning of the festival of the great mysteries at athens the eleventh night after that eclipse the two armies being in view of each other darius kept his men under arms and took a general review of his troops by torchlight this seems to have led to a great deal of disorderly tumult in the assyrian camp a fact which was noticed by alexander several of his friends urged him to make a night attack on the enemy's camp but he preferred that his macedonians should have a good night's rest and it was then that he uttered the celebrated answer i will not steal a victory plutarch enters upon some rather interesting moral reflections connected with this answer but which of course are foreign to the subject of this volume this eclipse happened on september twenty three hundred thirty one b c and was total the middle of the eclipse being at about eight fifteen p m it follows therefore that the celebrated battle of arbella was fought on october one three hundred thirty one b c in two hundred nineteen b c an eclipse of the moon was seen in mycia according to polybius the date of september one has been assigned for this eclipse which is said to have so greatly alarmed some gaulish mercenary troops in the service of attalus king of pergamos that he had to get rid of them as soon as he could make terms with them to go home on the eve of the battle of pina when perseus king of macedonia was conquered by paulus a Aemilius, there happened an eclipse of the moon plutarch in his life of paulus a Aemilius, speaking of his army having settled down in a camp says when they had supped and were thinking of nothing but going to rest on a sudden the moon which was then at full and very high began to be darkened and after changing into various colours was at last totally eclipsed the romans according to their custom made a great noise by striking upon vessels of brass and held up lighted faggots and torches in the air in order to recall her light but the macedonians did no such thing horror and astonishment seized their whole camp and a whisper passed among the multitude that this appearance portended the fall of the king as for aemilius he was not entirely unacquainted with this matter he had heard of the elliptic inequalities which bring the moon at certain periods under the shadow of the earth and darken her till she has passed that quarter of obscurity and receives light from the sun again nevertheless as he was wont to ascribe most events to the deity was a religious observer of sacrifices and of the art of divination he offered up to the moon eleven heifers as soon as he saw her regain her former lustre at break of day he also sacrificed oxen to hercules to the number of twenty without any auspicious sign but in the twenty-first the desired tokens appeared and he announced victory to his troops provided they stood upon the defensive the astronomical knowledge ascribed in this account to paulus a Aemilius constitutes a very interesting feature in this record because the romans though they were good at most things were by no means adepts at the science of astronomy livy tells us that sulpicius gallus one of the roman tribunes foretold this eclipse first to the consul and then with his leave to the army whereby that terror which eclipses were wont to breed in ignorant minds was entirely taken off and the soldiers more and more disposed to confide in officers of so great wisdom and of such general knowledge this eclipse is often identified with that of june twenty one one hundred sixty eight b c but johnson gives reasons why this cannot be the case and that the eclipse in question was that which happened on the night of june ten to eleven one hundred sixty seven b c and commenced about midnight whereas the eclipse of one hundred sixty eight b c was nearly over when the moon was above the horizon at rome stockwell however fixes on the eclipse of september three one hundred seventy two b c as that which was connected with the battle of pydna josephus speaking of the barbarous acts of herod says and that very night there was an eclipse of the moon there had been some controversy respecting the identification of this eclipse the only one mentioned by josephus 
which also is associated with herod's last illness it not having been easy to reconcile some discordant chronological statements connected with the length of herod's reign and the date when he began to reign on the whole probably we shall be safe in saying that the reference is to the eclipse of march thirteen four b c this was a partial eclipse to the extent of less than half the moon's diameter a defalcation of light sufficient however to attract public notice even at three a m seeing that no doubt even at that hour the streets of jerusalem were in a state of turmoil owing to the burning alive by herod of some seditious rabbis it should be stated however that hind assigns the account by josephus to the eclipse which occurred on january nine one b c on this occasion the moon passed nearly centrally through the earth's shadow soon after midnight emerging at two fifty seven a m on the early morning of january ten local mean time at jerusalem tacitus mentions an eclipse of the moon as having happened soon after the death of augustus this has been identified with the eclipse of september twenty seven a d fourteen tacitus says the moon in the midst of a clear sky became suddenly eclipsed the soldiers who were ignorant of the cause took this for an omen referring to their present adventures to their labors they compared the eclipse of the planet and prophesied that if to the distressed goddess should be restored her wonted brightness and splendor equally successful would be the issue of their struggle hence they made a loud noise by ringing upon brazen metal and by blowing trumpets and cornets as she appeared brighter or darker they exalted or lamented there was an eclipse of the moon on the generally recorded date of the crucifixion of our lord april three a d thirty three hind found that our satellite emerged from the earth's dark shadow about a quarter of an hour before she rose at jerusalem six hours thirty six minutes p m but the penumbra continued upon her disk for an hour afterwards on january one a d forty seven a total eclipse of the moon was seen at rome and on the same night an island rose up in the aegean sea the total eclipse of february twenty two a d seventy two noted by pliny is the first in which it is recorded that sun and moon were both visible at the same time the eclipse occurring when the sun was rising and the moon setting trithenius speaks of an eclipse of the moon observed in the time of morovius johnson identifies it with the eclipse of september fifteen four hundred fifty two a d it was from morovius that the line of french kings known as Merovigians received their name on april sixteen a d six hundred eighty three according to nastasius the papal historian the moon for nearly the whole night exhibited a blood-red appearance and did not emerge from obscurity till cock growing in a d six hundred ninety an eclipse of the moon was observed in wales we are told that the moon was turned to the color of blood this would seem to be the first eclipse of the moon recorded in britain the anglo-saxon chronicle tells us that in a d seven hundred thirty four the moon was as if it had been sprinkled with blood and archbishop tatwine and beda died and egbert was hallowed bishop the intended inference apparently is that the moon had something to do with the deaths of the two ecclesiastics but this story will not hold water beda it may be remarked is the correct name of the man generally known to us as the venerable Bede it is evident that from the description of the moon it exhibited on that occasion the well-known coppery hue which is a recognized feature of many total eclipses of our satellite this eclipse occurred on january twenty four beginning at about one a m on the night of january twenty three a d seven hundred fifty three the moon was covered with a horrid black shield this is the record of an eclipse it occurred at about midnight and apparently we are entitled to infer that on this occasion the moon disappeared altogether instead of being discoverable during the total phase by exhibiting a coppery hue in a d seven hundred fifty five or seven hundred fifty six in orridge on november twenty three there happened an exceedingly interesting event which stands i think without a precedent in the annals of science an eclipse of the moon contemporaneous with an occultation of a planet by the moon this singular combination is thus described in the annals of roger d hovenden on the eighth day before the calends of december the moon on her fifteenth day being about her full appeared to be covered with the colour of blood and then the darkness decreasing she returned to her usual brightness but 
in a wondrous manner a bright star followed the moon and passing across her preceded her when shining at the same distance which it had followed her before she was darkened the details here given are not astronomically quite correct but let that pass the writer's intention is fairly clear calculation shows that the eclipse occurred on november twenty three and that the planet which was jupiter was concealed in the evening by the moon for about an hour from seven hours thirty minutes to eight hours thirty minutes p m the immersion taking place about the end of the total phase this is the first occultation of a star or planet by the moon observed and recorded in england under the year seven hundred ninety five the anglo-saxon chronicle says in this year the moon was eclipsed between cock-crowing and dawn on the fifth of the calends of april and erdwolf succeeded to the kingdom of the northumbrians on the second of the ides of may this signifies that the eclipse happened on march twenty eighth between three hours and six hours in the morning the method of dividing the hours of night into equal portions of three hours each being still in use there was no eclipse in seven hundred ninety five on the date in question but there was one in seven hundred ninety six so we may suppose an error in the year this assumed johnson found that the eclipse began at four hours a m was total for nearly an hour and ended at about seven and a half hours so that the moon set eclipsed but the above assumption is dispensed with by lynn who substitutes one of his own for a fifth of the calends he reads fifth of the ides which means april nine and on that day in seven hundred ninety five he says there was an eclipse of the moon but i have not found any other record of it in the year a d eight hundred according to the anglo-saxon chronicle the moon was eclipsed at the second hour of the night eight hours p m on the seventeenth day of the calends of february johnson finds that there was an eclipse of the moon on january fifteenth the middle of the eclipse occurred at eight hours thirty four minutes nine tenths of the moon's upper limb having been obscured under the date of eight hundred six the anglo-saxon chronicle says this year was the moon eclipsed on the calends first of september an erd wolf king of the northumbrians was driven from his kingdom and anberth bishop of hexham died this eclipse was total the totality lasting from nine hours thirty seven minutes to ten hours fifty nine minutes p m on february fifteen eight hundred seventeen according to the annals fall dunsen an eclipse of the moon was observed in the early evening at paris and on the same night a comet was seen this comet is described by another authority as a monstrous one and as being in sagittarius on february five the chinese date it for february seventeen and place it near the stars a and y tauri in eight hundred twenty eight two lunar eclipses were seen in europe the first on july one very early in the morning and the second on the morning of christmas day the anglo-saxon chronicle thus speaks of the second eclipse in this year the moon was eclipsed on midwinter's mass night and the same year king egbreth subdued the kingdom of the mercians and all that was south of the humber the totality occurred after midnight there is some confusion in the year of this eclipse the chronicle giving it as eight hundred twenty seven whilst calculation shows that it must have been eight hundred twenty eight lynn defines midwinter's mass night as christmas eve under the date of nine hundred four the anglo-saxon chronicle says in this year the moon was eclipsed there were two total eclipses of the moon this year one on may thirty one and the other on november twenty five and it does not appear which one is referred to in the chronicle cited another writer sidrenus speaks of a great eclipse of the moon this year which he says foretold the death of a kinsman of the emperor on october six one thousand nine there was a total eclipse of the moon which presumably is referred to in the statement that this year the moon was changed into blood on november eighth ten forty four there was a large partial eclipse in the morning raoul glaber a french chronicler who died about ten fifty comments upon it thus in what manner it happened whether a prodigy brought to the pass by the deity or by the intervention of some heavenly body remains known to the author of knowledge for the moon herself became like dark blood only getting clear of it a little before the dawn truly those times were the dark ages in which ignorance and folly were rampant seeing that more than one thousand years previously the greeks knew all about the causes of eclipses under ten seventy eight the anglo-saxon chronicle says 
in this year the moon was eclipsed three nights before candlemas and a eagle wig the world-wide abbot of evesham died on st juliana's mass day february sixteen and in this year was the dry summer and wildfire came in many shires and burned many towns johnson found that a total eclipse of the moon happened in the early evening of january thirty on may five eleven ten in the reign of henry i there occurred a total eclipse of the moon during which says the anglo-saxon chronicle the moon appeared in the evening brightly shining and afterwards by little and little its light waned so that as soon as it was night it was so completely quenched that neither light nor orb nor anything at all of it was seen and so it continued very near until day and then appeared full and brightly shining it was on this same day a fortnight old all the night the air was very clear and the stars over all the heaven were brightly shining and the tree fruits on that night were sorely limped the totality occurred before midnight it is evident that this was an instance of a black eclipse when the moon becomes quite invisible instead of shining with the familiar coppery hue in eleven seventeen there were two total eclipses the first one on june sixteen and the second on december ten the latter is thus referred to in the anglo-saxon chronicle in the night of the third of the ides of december the moon was far in during a long time of the night as if it were all bloody and afterwards eclipsed the totality commenced at eleven thirty six p m it is recorded by matthew paris in connection with the death of henry i that the moon also was eclipsed the same year on the twenty ninth of july eleven thirty five these words seem to indicate a total eclipse of the moon johnson gives the date as december twenty two eleven thirty five if this is correct the text of the chronicle must be corrupt the whole eclipse was not visible in england the moon setting before the middle of the eclipse stephen had been crowned king the same day namely december twenty two on june thirty thirteen forty nine there was a total eclipse of the moon visible at london to which some interest attaches archdeacon churton connects it with the following incident the worthy archbishop bradwardine who nourished in the reign of the norman edwards and died a d thirteen forty nine tells a story of a witch who was attempting to impose on the simple people of the time it was a fine summer's night and the moon was suddenly eclipsed make me good amends said she for old wrongs or i will bid the sun also to withdraw his light from you bradwardine who had studied the arabian astronomers was more than a match for this simple trick without calling in the aid of the saxon law tell me he said at what time you will do this and we will believe you or if you will not tell me i will tell you when the sun or the moon will next be darkened in what part of their orb the darkness will begin how far it will spread and how long it will continue an eclipse of the moon which happened when columbus was at the island of jamaica proved of great service to him when he was in difficulties owing to the want of food supplies which the inhabitants refused to afford the eclipse was a total one and so far as the description goes the eclipses of april two fourteen ninety three and march one fifteen o four both respond to the recorded circumstances both were total and both occurred soon after sunset but inasmuch as in the life of columbus written by his son the incident is placed nearly at the end of the work there can be no doubt that it is the later of the above eclipses which was the one in question the story is very graphically told by sir a helps in the words following the indians refused to minister to their wants any longer and famine was imminent but just at this last extremity the admiral over fertile in devices bethought him of an expedient for re-establishing his influence over the indians his astronomical knowledge told him that on a certain night an eclipse of the moon would take place one would think that people living in the open air must be accustomed to see such eclipses sufficiently often not to be particularly astonished at them but columbus judged and as the event proved judge rightly that by predicting the eclipse he would gain a reputation as a prophet and command the respect and the obedience due to a person invested with supernatural powers he assembled the cacicus of the neighboring tribes then by means of an interpreter he reproached them with refusing to continue to supply provisions to the spaniards 
the god who protects me he said will punish you you know what has happened to those of my followers who have rebelled against me and the dangers which they encountered in their attempt to cross haiti while those who went at my command made the passage without difficulty soon too shall the divine vengeance fall on you this very night shall the moon change her color and lose her light in testimony of the evils which shall be sent upon you from the skies the night was fine the moon shone down in full brilliancy but at the appointed time the predicted phenomenon took place and the wild howls of the savages proclaimed their abject terror they came in a body to columbus and implored his intercession they promised to let him want for nothing if only he would avert this judgment as an earnest of their sincerity they collected hastily a quantity of food and offered it at his feet at first diplomatically hesitating columbus presently affected to be softened by these entreaties he consented to intercede for them and retiring to his cabin performed as they supposed some mystic rite which should deliver them from the threatened punishment soon the terrible shadow passed away from the face of the moon and the gratitude of the savages was as deep as their previous terror but being blended with much awe it was not so evanescent as gratitude often is and henceforth there was no failure in the regular supply of provisions to the castaways tycho brahe observed a lunar eclipse on july seventh fifteen ninety he writes in the morning about three three slash four hours the moon began to be eclipsed in this eclipse it is notable that both luminaries were at the same time above the horizon a like case which pliny cites for the centre of the sun emerged when the moon was two degrees elevated above the western horizon and when her centre was setting the centre of the sun was elevated nearly two degrees on august sixteenth fifteen ninety eight there occurred a total eclipse of the moon observed by kepler in which during totality a part of the moon was visible and the rest invisible he says that while one half of the disc was seen with great difficulty the other half was discernible by a deep red light of such brilliancy that at first he was doubtful whether our satellite was immersed in the earth's shadow at all this is an instance of the simultaneous operation of those causes whatever they may be which result in a totally eclipsed moon being sometimes wholly invisible and sometimes entirely visible as a copper-colored disk an eclipse of the moon which happened on the morning of july sixth sixteen ten may be mentioned as having been the first to be viewed through a telescope the eclipse was only a large partial one the following record of the fact is due to tycho brahe the beginning of the eclipse of the moon as observed through the roman telescope appeared like a dark thread in contact with the shadow a description which cannot be said to be unduly explicit in sixteen twenty on june fifteen there was a total eclipse of the moon when during the total phase the moon was seen with great difficulty it shone moreover like the thinnest nebula far fainter than the milky way without any copper tinge about the middle of the second hour nothing at all could be seen of the moon with the naked eye and through the telescope so doubtfully was anything seen that no one could tell whether the moon was not something else it is expressively stated however that the sky was quite clear kepler also observed this eclipse and says that the moon quite disappeared though stars of the fourth and fifth magnitudes were plainly visible in this same year sixteen twenty there was on december nine another total eclipse when the moon altogether disappeared so that nothing could be seen of it though the stars shone brightly all around she continued lost and invisible for a quarter of an hour more or less this observation seems to have been made at ingolstadt wendelinus mentions the eclipse of april fourteen sixteen twenty three in connection with the question of the visibility of the moon when totally eclipsed he says but sometimes it so far retains the light derived from the sun that you would doubt whether any part of it were eclipsed this eclipse was observed by cassendi and if the above record is correct it is the more remarkable seeing that the eclipse was not total only eleven twelfths of the moon's diameter being obscured on april twenty five sixteen fourteen on the occasion of a total eclipse hevelius noted that the moon wholly disappeared when immersed in the earth's shadow crabtree is stated by flamsteed to have observed this eclipse but he does not plainly state that he lost sight of the moon 
crabtree or his editor dates this eclipse for april four ferguson for april fifteen there appears to be some muddle as between old style and new style ferguson professing to be n s is evidently wrong hevelius gives the double date fifteen slash twenty five which is evidently right on june sixteenth sixteen sixty six the moon was seen in tuscany to rise eclipsed the sun not having yet set in the w on may twenty sixth sixteen sixty eight an eclipse of the moon was in progress in the early morning when the sun was seen to rise by members of the academy of sciences who were observing the phenomenon at montmartre near paris on december twenty third seventeen o three the moon when totally immersed was seen at avignon showing a ruddy light of such brilliancy that we are told it had the appearance of a transparent body illuminated by a light placed behind johnson finds that the total phase took place in the early morning and lasted from five hours thirty six minutes to seven hours twenty two minutes a m the lunar eclipse of may eighteen seventeen sixty one as observed by Warchington at stockholm furnishes a remarkable instance of the invisibility of the moon on certain occasions when completely immersed in the earth's shadow the total immersion of the moon took place at ten hours forty one minutes p m the part of the margin of the lunar disk which had last entered the shadow was fairly conspicuous for five or six minutes after the immersion and to the naked eye exhibited a lustre equal to that of a star of the second magnitude but at ten hours fifty two minutes this part as well as the whole of the rest of the moon's body had disappeared so completely that not the slightest trace of any portion of the lunar disk could be discerned either with the naked eye or with the telescope although the sky was clear and the stars in the vicinity of the moon were distinctly visible in the telescope after more than half an hour's search orgentin at length discovered the whereabouts of the moon by means of a faint light which was visible at the eastern edge of the disk a few minutes afterwards some persons of acute vision were able to discern and the naked eye a trace of the moon looking like a patch of thin vapor but more than half the disk was still invisible an eclipse of the moon on march twenty ninth eighteen o one was observed by humboldt on board ship of the island of Baru, not far from cartagena de las indias in the caribbean sea he remarks that he was exceedingly struck with the greater luminous intensity of the moon's disk under a tropical sky than in my native north johnson makes humboldt to refer to the greater clearness of the reddened disk but these words do not appear either in the german or in the english version a total eclipse of the moon occurred on june tenth eighteen sixteen as observed by beer and madler and others the moon completely disappeared the summer of eighteen sixteen be it remembered was very wet and probably this had something to do with the moon's invisibility at the eclipse in question on october thirteenth eighteen thirty seven there happened a total eclipse of the moon of which sir j herschel and admiral w h smythe have left us interesting accounts the changes of tint both as regards times and places on the moon's disk recorded by the latter are very remarkable and the tints themselves varied very much inter c the admiral speaks of copper sea-green neutral tint and silvery as hues visible in one part of the moon or another and at one time or another end of eclipses of the moon mentioned in history